Hi, everybody. Um, Perfect. We will have a microphone for roving questions, etc. But um, Barbara, I think that you've got a plan for the rest of our session. Well, I think I've got a very good one. <laughs> I, I think you, you have a lot of stuff thrown at you um, over the last several hours, and you, um, I know it's been a lot to school. So I think it's the time for you people to talk as well. And one of the things that I ask some and some of you have. Kind of really, uh, to, to do is to bring or wear or take some some form of your representation of yourself. And so right now, um, I know um, I know that there are some people who are very anxious to share part of what they brought with you. But I also like when you do that to see if you can think of any way that you can connect that with your teaching at all, any any kind of way that you might bring that idea of community representation into your uh, classroom as well. Hi everybody, this is nothing different from what I wear every day of my life. So I'll walk around so you can see on my hand, on this finger I wear a ring that has a Hebrew word on it. And the word is chai. It means life. And I was given this ring to commemorate a specific and important event in my life um, that has to do with religion. It was from in honor of my bat mitzvah, which in Hebrew um, means a daughter of the commandment. So that's something I wear every day because it's not always comfortable to be Jewish. And I'm, I'm an invisible minority. But I'm comfortable in myself, and I'm very bicultural, and I'm bilingual, multilingual. So this is just a symbol that I wear every day, and it makes me feel like I'm connected to my community when I'm not in my community. And I also wear um, a prayer around my neck. And I have to say it first in Hebrew so I can translate it to English, because my brain doesn't work any other way. And I wear this prayer every day because it's a reminder that, again, it connects me to this large community that when before me, a few thousand years before me, and hopefully will continue a few thousand years after me. And it continues every day around me with lots of other people who are also Jewish. And the prayer is called the Shema, which means the name. Shema Israel Adonai Elchein Adonai Echad, which means hear me God for you are the only one. And it's a loop, so it never ends. And we say this prayer every day when we wake up in the morning and before we go to bed at night or whatever I'm stressed. <laughs> So how do I use this when I'm teaching? Well, I'm a linguist, and I teach my two second languages, which are English and Spanish. And sometimes I've also taught people how to be teachers and how to be language teachers. And I, I talk a lot in my teaching about including everyone, because our classrooms also become a community, and our students become the learners in our community, and we create a community with them. And I don't necessarily talk about my prayer or my ring, but I talk about those ideas because those are ideas that are important in me as a, as a minority in a large country. Okay? Yes. Thank you. humanity of the situation first? 
I think so. Or is it conscious or unconscious? Like guys get to wear blue jeans in class, but women generally don't. Right? Well, we do sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 is, it, is it more informal? I mean, you know. I Um, and it's a great little 
icebreaker on the first day. It can be a lot of fun. Sometimes they pick uh, uh, cultural objects. Sometimes it's to do with family or friends. Um, a lot of times it's their cell phones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, could you see a way, suppose you were teaching this, going to introduce Southeast Asia? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. So, suppose you were going to try and introduce Southeast Asia into this oh, yes. conversation. Okay. Yep. Could you see a way of using those kind of strategies? Actually, we used um, a, a film last year at the college, uh, last spring, called The Overture. And we actually looked at a, some of the pic similar pictures to what you were showing, where the um, Thai people started to wear kind of Western dress. There's a great scene with two, um, uh, two rulers, and one's wearing kind of more tr traditional garb, and one's wearing a Western suit. And it led to some really interesting conversations <coughs> about modernization and about Westernization. Um, and so, yeah, so we used that idea of appearance as a way in to talk about culture. And I think, I think um, we don't have time in this workshop, but it would have been really interesting to think of some of these um, invisible differences that you're, for example, uh, across genders. I mean, the, 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 I was thinking when Paul was talking this morning, the position of the Naga, the serpent, in particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, the prominence, I mean, of course it's prominent in India, and the bread is prominent in Chinese culture too, but um, I think the, the reasons are often different, and if you look at any creature that crosses the like, surface of those land and, and land and water, or land or crocodile is land and water, birds are air and sky, any, any creature that crosses boundaries like that is, is, is in this liminal space, and they are often incorporated into, into ritual in a very interesting way, and human beings who, who fitted into that space. So men dressing as women, or older women who can no longer bear children, who have the body of a woman but the lack of fertility, also fit into that kind of space. And in the past, they've been, and still in the present, spirit mediums are often in that, in that kind of uh, framework. So, and whereas in, in today's world, spirit mediums are often considered you know, somewhat marginalised, I should say. But um, the, the, except Jack, who talked about the 700 spirit mediums or where she saw it in Borneo, but, uh, <laughs> but, but in the past, they've been very important. So, you know, accessing these individual, these, these, these differences, or talking about martial and how they've developed and masculinity is becoming masculine, what, what it is, can sometimes open up cross-cultural conversations as well. It might provide it. I know that many, most of you will not teach Southeast Asia as a topic, so you've got to slide it in to something that's already happening. So that's what I'm trying to think about, about how ways you might slide, slide something on Southeast Asia into a pre-existing or framework that you already have. Related to that, one thing to, you, can, you can do is with visual material. Um, images of, of, of Buddhist and Hindu divinities often defy our students' ability to be able to, to discern their, their, their gender um, or their sex, I should say, yeah. um, because of these different aesthetics and different standards of beauty that are highly idealized for images of gods. Uh, Buddha is a great example. Uh, he has a totally exceptional anatomy that he was born with. Um, but there's also then stylistic changes that take place. I showed you some Gupta images uh, where it's quite clear that there was a transformation conceptually taking place, a sort of suppression of the secondary sex characteristics. Um, and it re results in these very svelte clean forms. Um, there are Hindu gods of Shiva, for example, that my students would like to insist are female, but they're decidedly male, gendered male, um, in, in terms of the Indian stories and the mythology. And it's a yogic body. It's not a it's not a, um, a peasant farmer like all of the Greek gods would be from the Indian perspective because they're all heavily, heavily muscled. Um, that emphasis on 
the, the, the male anatomy through the athletic form that was a Greco-Roman tradition and has been picked up and obviously still our late back TV standard of beauty, right, for men. Uh, it's not a standard of beauty that wouldn't necessarily be emphasized in other cultures where perhaps a, 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 a more well-fed, fed, robust, healthy, somewhat fleshy form would be regarded as more what you might aspire to, your healthier, your, your little bit prettier, maybe from their standpoint. You see the Borgador, uh, this great uh, monument in, in Indonesia where they have the law of cause and effect in the Maha Karma Vibhanga text uh, depicted. Uh, and it's, it's your actions and the results. Um, and it shows very clearly if you, if you speak ill of other people, you're reborn ugly, and it shows them as coarse people that look rather simian, right? And if you treat other people well and speak well of them, you're reborn as sort of these princely figures that sit in pavilions, and they're, they're full figured, and they're very beautiful and profound. They're not, they're not simian, they're not athletes, they're, they're, they're very healthy, robust kind of forms. So, so to think about these differences, you can also use visual material, I think, to get people to think about themselves, so sort of think back on well, what standard beauty am I, am I expecting when I look at these kind of things? Yeah. Um, well, Jen, and then the gentleman in front of Yeah, we, um, it's, it's, a great point. it's a great point, Paul. Um, in my classes, we often do a, a project that's uh, uh, reimagining a folk tale, a fairy tale, a myth. So that it has, um, it's, it blends traditional story and a new reinterpretation or globalization of that story. Right? So, for example, at Asia Time in Concrete, um, my students right now are looking at different depictions of Superman. And they're really, I find they're really good at finding mining images, right? They're not so good at finding texts but they're really great at going online and coming up with astonishing images. So we just, um, there's a character that Barbara, you know, Simar, Simar in Indonesia. Yes, yes, yes. There's this, this character, Simar, and there's this, you know, they, so they found a Superman Simar. Right? So well, like Nima, the great, the sort of great warrior from Mahabharata. Right, right. So yeah, right. Warrior. So they can find all of these sort of combinations of, they found a Superman um, drama. They found a Superman kind of hybrid with the Virgin of Guadalupe. They found a, you know, it's really kind of interesting how good they um, That's an interesting point. I would just add, like, the earliest yeah. moon images from the Madre of Guadalupe, they, they look like this, they stand with the rope in one hand. Yeah. And a kimbo in a uh -huh. fist. Yeah. Like yeah. Superman, right? Um, and it's yeah. a big mus muscular yeah. body has to do with the, the origin of the Buddha image, but he's, right. he is a Superman. That's what the text right. said. The Buddha was a superhuman Superman. And then you can line these up and you can start to mine, like, well, what, what's similar, what's different? You can see it right there, right? And talk about the individual um, cultural aspects. Mm -hmm. For example, um, Seymour, getting back to Seymour, he eats a lot. Right? It's one of the sim his symbols, like he's he's a good guy and because of that he gets to you know, he eats a lot, he farts a lot, so he has a Superman symbol, but on his head he has a fork and a spoon. <laughs> okay. You know, and it's it's the Seymourization of Superman, right? And he's powered through the air by a fart, right? So, so I don't want to too vulgar, but it's you know, it's funny, but it's also like you can kind of pick out the Indonesian specific, you know, kind of Javanese shadow puppet character, mm -hmm. specific iconography, and then the like, you know, Marvel comics, mm -hmm. Western iconography, and it's very interesting. You can go the other way too, right? And you yeah. can look at actual history of comics uh, and look at how uh, Western standards and uh, of a comic book narrative and, and the approach to the portrayal of the great hero yeah. permeated Indian culture in a march into comics, which were basically developed to present back to Indian kids all the all the great heroes and the mythological That's figures. Right. And, and they portray them up. as hero yeah. kind of right. looking heroes and they're big and muscular and it's an interesting, yeah. really interesting uh, history. Yeah. But it's also interesting to think about these global flows. I mean, of course now on the internet we can find them as you sit in the and you can find them all very easily, but it's, I think there's a tendency to think it's something and yet, of course, these global flows have been happening for a very long time. So it may be a way of helping students to think historically, because our students are so present-oriented, you know, two years ago is ancient history there. <laughs> um, uh, it's, 
so trying to get them to think about how how communication might have happened when there was no internet, when there were no cell phones, and how did these global flows happen? And I think the question that Paul raised at the beginning, which is pertinent, you know, why did something like Superman catch on? Um, and you know, what what do people do with that catchy image? It's like hamburgers in Japan and a certain seaweed. You know, that people like this taste, but they they localize it too. And, and I think that's a that can be in a very multicultural kind of classroom. That can be a real way of incorporating everybody. So getting something as you were saying is more more equal. I mean, where where you don't have the people who speak English very well and are very articulate. Dominating the whole, whole thing. Yeah, I'm a historian, so sometimes I teach um, I teach both world history and Asian surveys, and, and I'm an East Asianist. Um, so uh, there's a lot of chance for me to obviously talk about Asia, but Southeast Asia being not outside my field, and it's one of the areas that's most neglected in the Asian studies in the <coughs> United States. Um, maybe a little bit. You know, they're usually at, at the AAS, the panels about Southeast Asia is smaller than maybe East Asia or South, even South Asia um, because of the history of it, I guess. But I think for, for me to incorporate Southeast Asian studies, um, and I think multiculturalism is the key because uh, multicult the diversity and pluralism of the region that you talk about um, is pretty unique as compared to East Asia, Latin America, um, North America, and to a certain extent Europe. Because you have multiple religions, multiple multiple languages, multiple uh, colonial histories, multiple oceanic and continental influences. So um, it's just a good region to, to teach any world cultures. Um, but I haven't really used it. Uh, personal kind of attire or images to, to talk about that. I usually use food and architecture when I teach culture and history. Um, so you can easily bring in Southeast Asia when you talk about architecture and talk about Angkor Wat. You can easily talk about Thai restaurants and the students get excited when you talk about that. Um, so I, I find that that's easier. But if you talk about those things that um, can change over time. Uh, for example, the Cambodian students, especially the Hmong students, that we don't have a lot here. Um, I used to be in Minnesota for a couple of years in Wisconsin. There were a lot of Hmong, Hmong students. Um, it, that would be a very good case for, you know, even in the 80s when the Cambodians first came here, they would have preserved more of their clothing and rituals. And certainly it would be very easy to get students interested in that and actually ask them to go to the temples, to go to the, uh, to the communities. And uh, I think the best way is to experience the culture. Uh, if students don't have a chance to experience the culture, they're not going to be interested in the culture. Um, so we have to create multiple environments in the classrooms for them to imagine themselves as someone who knows someone from Southeast Asia, uh, whether personally or culturally but eventually. Um, I think we can all do that because everyone probably has tried something relating to Southeast Asia before, whether it's Thai food or uh, Cambodian high school student classmate or um, parents or grandparents uh, have served in Vietnam or someone uh, who's uh, Catholic who, who, who might know some Filipino who's Catholic and someone who might be interested in Muslim and wanted to know more about Indonesia. So I think you have to create these kinds of things and uh, to have a multiculturalism being normal, not abnormal. Yes. Yeah. Turn around and I think that you can. Can you turn around and then I think um, It is very important that you talk about when you raise the point that young people now are more about prison oriented rather than Which country belongs to this and 
that case of Cambodian, uh, uh, Cambodia and Thailand, uh, when we talk about history, uh, especially related to the temple and things like that. So I don't know, like, how, because it's based on the person who runs history, who wrote the history, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the young people <coughs> try to go back, so what, what is the best way in order to, for them to benefit from a historical perspective? It's complicated. Yeah, history um, obviously is depends on who's writing it. It's often written by the winner. Um, it's often contested. Um, in the Cambodian context, you know, we often think about the way that this um, interest in the past in the Grand Corps and the way it's been valorized, particularly by French colonial administrators and educators, kind of created a, a culture of particular art making that that was based on imitation as the best form of art production. Um, so you have generations of students who were trained to make faithful reproductions of Emporian things. We still see that at play in Cambodia today. It's really commodified for the tourist market, but still ongoing. Difficult for Cambodia compared to Thailand would be an example for contemporary artists to, to be presentists, uh, to be sort of engaging in contemporary phenomenon. So um, the past can be, um, it can be used for positive um, identity purposes, but it can also be difficult to escape from. So it can be used to create a kind of freedom or party for it. It can be a kind of big uh, chat to you as well. Um, in terms of the understanding of the past, uh, certainly there's competing discourses about history at the sort of the the year case. Um, the problem there is not so much that people don't agree on history, it's that there isn't any. Um, we know about the temple in the 11th century, and then and we know about it um, being on the border uh, when the map was drawn in 1905 or six um, and seven, um, and it disappears from history until the thirties, and then comes back in like the late fifties. Um, because precisely, precisely the, the the point of the place is that it it wasn't a remote zone and it wasn't really it, even to this day it's not paid much attention to until it becomes relevant to the people. people and then before it could be being involved in our history. Ever. So I'm not sure that a uh, history lesson can resolve it. I don't think it can resolve it right here. Okay, so they can help us to think about it. And I think that's the benefit of history if it's done um, sensitively and far as a historian, obviously. And that, I mean, if you, to the extent that you can aspire to, to or, or as an art historian, to, to account for the, the, the evidence in the best level, manner that you can, and then create interpretations that make use of the most uh, evidence that's out there. I think you have a stronger argument if you can marshal various kinds of evidence. I'm kind of a, I'm like a, I'm a classicist on my approach. I believe you use everything that's available to you. You don't need to privilege written word over visual imagery, news, poetry, news, whatever. Um, and I think if you if you try to create a sensible picture, but understand that you can never have a completely objective understanding of it, um, that if you can you can frame a discussion that then can lead to dialogue and can and can possibly lead to some kind of um, Co cooperative understanding, but if, if it's simply history being used to assert certain ideological positions, which is how it's played, um, it's not particularly helpful. Um, on the contrary, it's, it's actually the basis for sowing more discord um, by trying to argue that somehow we can impose these ethnic identities into the remote past. Irredentism is, is part of this. Um, so history is not, is, like everything, history is not unqualified good. It, it's to how you use it. It's really how you approach it. I guess I kind of wanted to maybe build on that because it's a question that's kind of um, bouncing around in my head. <laughs> I'm a historian, and uh, so I'm wondering if, I, I mean, I can see where there's a problem. There seems to be a problem based on the, the conflicts that you're talking about in terms of all of this understanding of who had what, who did what. Um, but is there a place for local history to help, in a way, clarify? I mean, Clearly, if you're trying to, um, and this is just so interesting, that the problem that you outlined around trying to understand any kind of national identity and boundaries in history is obviously a huge problem. Is there a place for local history in all of this? Um, local communities? Are you speaking specifically about my, my case study or in general? Well, I guess in, in general, but um, I don't know if you've run across that, so that's probably not really what you're doing. But no, in terms of understanding this region, which 
this, I mean, I'm so ignorant of anything about this region. I went home last night and like looked at my big Atlas books to figure out like where exactly are we talking about here? And it's a big, it seems like the, the region could be almost seen as big as Australia. It's kind of only mostly water. Well, if you put Indonesia on a map, I think you could reach from the British Isles to Afghanistan. Wow. Is that right? Like, I mean, well, yes. but, but just looking at that uh, that shallow water shelf that you were talking about last night, that the kind of like the space seems to be about the size of the space of Australia, the Australian space. But um, is there a place in there for local? Is anybody doing that? Is there? I guess what kind of resources are there even if if the um, anything like an archives or whatever has been like sort of destroyed at times or part of this whole, um, you know, question of national identity. In general, I think there, there is a place for lo local history, but it often has to be exhumed and excavated and discussed. Sometimes the evidence isn't there. Uh, in the past, it's often the case our historical records didn't address these kinds of differences that we dwell on. So it's hard to even parse out exactly yeah. what, what we mean by that. And when we see imagery like an Angkor Wat, where there's a, a column of troops identified as the scene of uh, that's then presented by tour guides in Cambodia as, as, as Siamese people, as Thai people in other words, and they're presented differently from other people, and they have buck teeth, and they're, they're disorganized, they're kind of rabble-rousers. So the Cambodian narrative of this ethnic difference is that these are country bumpkin Thai people, and this is how they looked in the Angkorian period, and then they're clearly subordinate to the, to the Khmer. There's no reason whatsoever to think that those are Siamese people and AKA Thai people. And there's a big debate about this. So while on the one hand there is an acknowledgement of ethnic difference and, and localities and all of that, it may not be the ones that we expect. So we may not be able to glean the things that we want to find. So you mean looking at like sort of from the, the bottom up, so to speak, or local history can make it even more confusing. It may, it may it depends because if we're, if we're asserting or assuming these are pushing these, these identities back to local, local history can be a a, a, a recent construct too that's pushed into the past to try to capture something else, right? It can be um, I think local history has a place, and certainly it's a, there's a whole field of altering studies and all these kind of things to try to advance these perspectives. And the Fred, Fred, in your case, it's an unfortunate situation of the whole thing that precisely any kind of local perspective has been more or less obliterated and ignored completely. The region is not Khmer or Thai historically. It's other people, and they tend to be elephant hunters. And the only way that that, that part of the Dang Rek Mountain region came into the historical records of the, the, the lowland rice growing river areas of Angkor or of Ayutthaya was that they could get elephants from these people who would, who would hunt them and sell them or whatever. Um, so there is, there, I mean, it's not really Khmer or Thai if you really want to say, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, but it was very sp sort of sparsely populated. The local people there today, there today there's quite a lot of Thai sort of villages and things on the Thai side of the border, the Cambodian side is, was almost completely un unpopulated until the government decided to start pushing the development of the site and they, they purpose built a city there and resettled people there, brought them in to basically colonize it if you want or settle it or to make a claim on it um, without really any consideration of what kind of people were on the border. Um, so they, the, the worst probably effects of this conflict, certainly there's been damage to the temple and there's been soldiers that have been killed, but there's been entire displacements of people, especially on the Thai side, um, who are not consulted in this at all, are not particularly happy with the conflict, don't really have a red or a yellow shirt allegiance, but would really like the cross-border flow to continue to sort of selling their stuff and moving freely, and the border's sealed now. You can't, you can't move like you could in the past, like between the country sort of freely to be traded and whatever you need to do, you can see your family. So I, I think it would be nice in this case if there was a local perspective, but it's patently missing. And some people have observed this, but it's not, it's not, it's not, not it's foreign observers. Yeah. It's foreign observers that have argued this. And they say, well, then can we establish like a peace park, like, or something like Andorra uh, in between France and Spain or something like this, right? Um, but of course, that, that perspective is never something that would be endorsed or fly in, in the region. So, and you're right, it's important to consider the local Component, but whether or not that actually is a factor in how people decide at the national level in these countries to proceed to these. I think Barbara was sort of suggesting Vietnam, they often make their own lists of this, then they do actual. And I think, too, um, when you're teaching, you teach Busta history, right? So um, I think it's an opportunity for students to think about 
where is local history allowed or possible or useful? And in, in the United States, the, the, the nation state is well established. So if you do the local history, you're not challenging the state. You're, you're, you're supplying another piece of the jigsaw puzzle, another, uh, you, you're asserting your local identity. But it could be in a newer country or a less well established country that a local history is saying much more than that. Local history may be saying we were great in the past, we were independent in the past, you know, we had our own identities. And, and the question also is how many local voices can you have on the national stage and still retain the ensemble as it were as a group? And in Indonesia, which is the country I know best, um, there are eight major languages, but there are like 800 other languages, you know, it's a huge number. So the eight major languages, of course, have their history, but, and the, and, uh, the, the wife of, the, of Sahato, the wife of President Sahato, established this mini park where, where every, where all the major groups and some other ones too were allowed to build a house in their, like their ethnic group, and then everybody, and they called in carpenters. But there were many groups that were left out. So one group I know of was so incensed, they developed their own mini park on their own island, which had their house in it. And I remember talking to some when Indonesians started writing their own national history. There was a big debate about how many people can be in there asserting. And they deliberately excluded because they were afraid that once you get too many voices, the whole edifice starts to crumble. And that the collapse of Yugoslavia was like a, a body blow to the Indonesian psyche because they thought if people with white faces, could, you know, their countries could collapse like that. What about us? So local history, you know, you could, the students, it's not, it's problematic in some instances, and I think people, and then, of course, you could get this, what, what makes local history possible? It's, it's birth registers, death registers, often church records, uh, local letters, diaries, pictures, maybe photographs, whole lots of things that don't exist in many parts of the world. They don't have these kinds of, of things. So in many cases, as Paul was saying, you know, just digging stuff up that survived, and that survived by accident, really, may be one of the few ways the Philippines is one of the places where we can do right local history. There's quite good local histories from the Philippines. The reason is that the Spanish came in and had church registers. So they've got births and deaths and the number of people paying tax and that sort of thing, and they write those things down. The missionaries wrote reports. But the people themselves, unless they've been in the mission school, were largely illiterate. And then that applies to much. So you don't get history from the bottom, in a sense. It's all it's from the top. So it's 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 what meant. So anthropologists who do write local histories can only really go back so far, and then they're often they're dependent on on oral oral material, which and the great strength of the oral records is that it's constantly adjusting to conform with what the present demands are. So you can't take an oral history that was recorded in 1880 and and say, well, that's, it was, they were saying that in 18, it was probably like that in 1680, because it's changed bits and pieces that have dropped off along the way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very methodologically problematic, and I, I think students can, should be able to, you know, teaching anything about the past, or about, you know, what would you remember? You know, what, in, in 50 years time, what, how will people write the history of this area or law or whatever you want to choose? What do you think we remember at, at this time? And they probably have different ideas. And I think another thing, we were talking about museums um, in an earlier conversation, and I think, uh, Local museums and national museums can often be telling different stories um, and often sometimes conflicting stories. 
So one exercise that might be might be interesting would be to try and try if you were building a museum, what would you put in it? I have my students in Singapore. Singapore is the only is one of the um, most busiest ports in the world, but it's the only only major port that doesn't have a maritime museum. All the other ports are bottled down, all those, they all have a maritime museum. It doesn't. And so I had my students design a maritime museum for Singapore. Would you put in it? Um, and it was quite interesting to see the different the different um, ideas that they they would construct. Um, another time I've had students take a town in Southeast Asia and construct a, mu a museum for that town. I've got six rooms. What are you going to take as a theme for each of those six rooms? And it's it can quite it can lead to quite interesting discussions. Why did you choose that particular theme and you know that particular so but you can do it like sort of this historiographical